Professor Sir George Porter is ready with the first question now to the team from the King's School, Tynemouth. Tim Flintoff, Neil Anderson, John Brewis and Derek Parsons. Tim, would you begin by telling us what it is you have to get out of water to make it suitable for hospital use? Uh, we need to remove bacteria and pyrogens. Well, now, your bacteria will be killed stone dead by the hydrogen peroxide, but what about the pyrogens? Pyrogens... What are pyrogens, for a start? Pyrogens are the waste products of bacteria, the many proteins, mm -hmm. and the hydrogen peroxide will oxidise these, probably to acids. And what happens to the acids? We just hope to remove these acids on a, with another ion exchange column. How would you detect um, exhaustion of your column? Because it would be very dangerous, wouldn't it, to have hydrogen peroxide pass through to the final water? Well, a quick visual test we could use is to see if bubbles of oxygen are being produced. Normally you can see this happening if the column's fresh or not too bad, but uh, if the enzyme's being denatured, oxygen bubbles won't be produced. We've also found some slight discolouring in the column when the enzyme is denatured. Derek, it's one thing to have a clever idea and quite another one to get industry to, to take it up. You've got to do some sums. You, in fact, you've done some calculations, haven't you, to find out um, how economically you can produce clean water for hospitals. Could you tell us about the results of those calculations? Well, we found we could calculate that the price of one litre of sterilised water could cost below 14 pence a litre. Uh, as compared with the Maybe present? 50 to 80 pence. So it's a very big saving. Mm -hmm. But now, how did you arrive at those um, calculations? Did you take into account, for instance, the packaging of the water? Surely it's a very big factor in the cost, the, the cost of clean glassware, replacing glassware for bottling and so on. Did you think about that? If each hospital was to have its own small unit. We could pipe the water with the hydrogen peroxide in around the hospital to the point of use and have small columns decomposing it there. Oh, full-scale distribution. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the more distribution, the bigger the distribution system, the more danger of contamination. You must have thought of those things as well. And hydrogen peroxide would be in the water still. While it's going around. Mm -hmm. That's a clever idea. Mm -hmm. Neil, um, enzymes are fairly unstable things, and you did better anyway with other catalysts like manganese dioxide. There are others one might think of. <coughs> why, why use enzymes? Well, uh, for one thing, it's a novel new approach that um, we haven't heard any industry using it for water sterilisation. You don't have to be new <laughs> just to be new if it's, if it's not as good as an old process. All right, just a quick one then, Tim. Why do you think catalase would be better than manganese dioxide? Well, catalase, uh, there's, no and there's no chance of contamination. Manganese dioxide is a very reactive chemical, and if that got into sterile water it could have rather serious consequences. And we could use platinum, that's very unreactive. Yes, but the platinum wouldn't do uh, much good in the body either. If you... Catalase is also used in the body to break down hydrogen peroxide. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our winners in week two were the Bumblebee Brigade from Wrexham. Now, their work on Bombus agrorum, alias Bombus pascorum, was aimed at making life easier for people in glasshouses. Large glasshouse complexes for growing produce and flowers the year round are spreading in Britain, indeed all over Europe. At the Welsh Horticultural College in winter, it's mainly flowers they crop. But the team from nearby Wrexham are interested to see how edible crops might be encouraged winter and summer. Pollination's the problem, Honeybees do a good job, but they like to hibernate. We thought that we could find another insect that could do the same job. We chose bumblebees for two reasons. Firstly, they are less selective in the crops which they pollinate, and they're in smaller colonies, which are easier to manage. This is a nest of a Bombus agrorum, which was found um, in a water trough. It is actually a mouse's nest, which has been converted into this nest for the bumblebees. The Wrexham bumblebees spent some time in the cooler, a fridge adapted to keep them within the required range of temperature and humidity during their enforced unseasonal sleep. Unfortunately, during the half-term holiday, somebody switched off the fridge and all the bees but this one died because of bacteria being able to flourish in the hibernation test tubes. 
They're working on ways to keep the temperature and humidity right so that the bees are in prime condition for taking to their nest boxes. We use two different types of nest box. The first, which was a two compartment nest box, had a feeding compartment in one side, which was well stocked with honey and flowers. And the second was the nesting compartment, which we filled with moss, which we collected and dried ourselves. The original idea was just to put the moss in the nest box and let the bee nest. But we thought that as the bee nests in a mouse's nest, we could simulate the conditions of a mouse's nest, which we did. The bee nested very successfully, and we had a vote whether to let it go or not. We wanted to see whether it would return to the nest now to set up a nest, and if so, we had succeeded in nesting it artificially. We thought that as the bee had made two cells and there was workers on the way, being already in larval stage, that it would return, but unfortunately it was killed. The second type was a single nest box compartment, which was placed in a flight cage, and the flight cage was stocked with flowers and honey instead of the nest box. All we did with this was just place the dried moss in and put a pellet of pollen in, put the bee in the nest box for a day or so, bunged up, and then we release it into the flight cage. Um, in the flight cage, there's a double compartment nest box. This is used for putting the queen in, and it's put in close confinement for two to three weeks till it starts a nest. When it has started a nest, a bung is removed from the hole and the workers are let out. The whole flight cage is covered with this nylon netting. Um, this keeps the bees in and forces them to pollinate the crops. The Wrexham team is trying out special lights for reviving the bees, in effect turning their winter into summer. What progress have you made since we saw you in the second heat? Well, we know uh, bees can't see red light. They can only see the, from the yellow band down to ultraviolet. So uh, we're experimenting with high-pressure sodium lamps and high-pressure mercury lamps at the moment because these are most commonly used in glass houses. Um, if experiments show that uh, the bee is sensitive to these lamps equally, well then we'll choose high-pressure sodium because it's more economical. You were also having uh, some problems with humidity during the bees' enforced hibernation in the fridge. Uh, what about that? Well, we thought that the water system wasn't good enough, so we decided to use salt solutions where the air is kept in equilibrium with the salt solutions. And we feel that we've almost got the problem beat, but we need to find the right humidity for the bees. Andrew Salisbury, Ian Wright, Susan Verity and Beverly Jones are the team from Bryn Allen School, Wrexham. Professor David Nichols begins. Beverly, when you first came to this project, were you interested in the bees or in pollination? Well, we were interested in both really because um, the school has honey beehives and they take them down to Kent to pollinate. And we heard of the problems that they have in pollinating the crops with honey bees. And so we thought there must be a better pollinator. So we decided to try the, the bumblebee instead. Susan, could you just clarify this? Tell us what you want to do is have bees working for you and pollinating next winter. or That's yeah. what the people in Kent want. Yeah. Now, they're all asleep now and you can't get them. They're all yeah. hibernating. What are you going to do now? Well, we could collect them <coughs> when they first come out of hibernation, which is about the beginning of March and then put them into our own hibernator for a few weeks while we get the lighting system set up so that we can try the bees to see if they react to the external condition the internal conditions which we simulated from the external con conditions outside or we could wait till september until the nest is dying off collect and collect the new queens put them into hibernation for a few weeks and then bring them out again for winter to be able to so they will nest at that time Ian, you say in your report that pollination by bees improves both the quantity and the quality of the crop, whatever it may be. Well, I certainly understand how it could improve the uh, quantity, because a sterile flower won't produce fruit, but I don't understand what the bees do for the quality control. Well, each pollen grain contributes to one seed of the new plant, and the bees, with the electric bee, 
not all the pollen grains fall directly into the flower itself, but what's, fall on the what, Sorry to interrupt you, but what's an electric bee? It's a vibrating rod, which is now used at present by the horticulturists mm. for pollination. And with the bees being, well, bumblebees being hairy, they will carry the pollen directly into the flower and distribute it and thus make more seeds. Yeah, because mm. if only one, one of the seeds gets pollinated in, a, say, a fruit which has more than one seed, it will only, say, be half pollinated and thus produce a less qu quality of a fruit. Ian, yeah, um, it sounds as though you've got to combine a whole lot of special qualities in a good pollinator. Is it possible, do you think, or going to be possible, to breed your own bee? Well, we felt that it's just that the heredity and genetics that we would have to go into would be too difficult for us to understand. Mm. And we were having so much success with the Bombus agrurum, and it seemed to be well suited that we would rather stick with the already established bee than attempt to develop our own. I see. Thank you very much. Finally, how the silicon chip has found an important role on the stage. Now, in Heat 3, it was the boys from Newcastle who most impressed the judges with their theatre lighting. I wonder if they're going to get top billing again today. But first of all, let's have a look at a film report of their work as we saw it in the heat. This is the theatre lighting control system that has been used in theatres since about 1920. Simply what it does is it introduces a varying resistance between the theatre light and its mains power supply. It is by varying these resistances that we gain control for the brightness of the light. Unfortunately, this means they are very difficult to operate and the spaghetti junction of wires that appears down here, it just becomes a lighting man's menace. We have decided to use a totally new principle for dimming the theatre lights. We are using the on-off principle, which all computers use, enabling our system to be connected to a computer. Here, we have a small bulb being switched on and off very slowly. We can adjust the speed at which it flashes on and off by this knob here. And if I make the speed very, very fast, you can see there's the illusion that the bulb is permanently on. If, using this knob, I now adjust the proportion of time on to the proportion of time off, we can achieve a dimming effect, like this. This is our computer system. The computer enables us to do many marvellous things with theatre lights, but problems do exist. In a computer, electronic signals are of very low voltages and are changing approximately once every millionth of a second, whereas stage lights take very high voltages at very high powers. Now, to overcome this problem, we built an electronic module which is housed inside this console. This is the silicon chip which converts the information given to the console from the computer into information which these individual electronic boards can understand. On each of these boards are two further electronic switches, the first of which operates 100 times a second, switching the light on and off. The second one simply provides the pulse required for main switching. The information which the computer gives to the electronics is dependent upon what keys I press on this keyboard. To start the evening's performance, I just follow the computer's instructions here, and you want to start, so we press letter S. And we will fade in the lights, and we'll fade them in slowly. And you can see what is happening with the lights on the screen here as they actually happen. One of the great advantages of our system is that all the information for the lights is stored on one of these cassette tapes. This enables the operator to merely press a button and let the computer do all the work and for me to sit back. However, should the operator want to intervene at any point during the play, for instance due to the fault of an actor, he can merely flip one of these switches and take control manually using these sliders here. Press on, press on, softly, but not so slow, faster. They have no right to butcher me! Ah! Come Oliver, let's go home. Yes, sir. Boom.